The world can't understand when North Korean people will cry after the former dictators, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il died. But those who grew up there in North Korea, we completely understand that. Because we first learned to say thank you so much to our general Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. And in North Korea, in every public place, even in our homes, we have their pictures hang on the wall. And every anniversary in the morning, we bow to their pictures. And whenever I receive the gift from my parents, instead of thanks to my parents, I thanked to the pictures. And I didn't feel it was strange. And until I was 14, I didn't think Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il went to the bathrooms or drink or smoke or drink echoes because I believed they were gods. But um, in 1994, when I saw Kim Il-sung's funeral and uh, when I heard Kim Jong-il married another woman, and I, from that moment, I slowly realized they might be human like me. And North Koreans are spend their entire lives inside the virtual prison without even knowing about the truth or the concept of human rights or they are subjected to the oppression. So not knowing about the outside world, you know, the oppressive life in North Korea seemed very normal. So I never thought about the freedom of speech, movement, press, and religion. And North Korean regimes are using elaborate deceptions as well as coercive tools of control. The, the North Korean leadership is able to indoctrinate and brainwash the vast majority of its citizens, depriving them of their natural right to learn the truth about the world. My parents' generation still strongly believes Kim Il-sung gave them a good life in the past, so they tend to respect Kim Il-sung more than Kim Jong-il. And my mom, who was brainwashed more than 50 years in North Korea, for her, it's still hard to believe that North Korea attacked South Korea first in 1950s, which started the Korean War. Uh, North Koreans are constantly inundated with anti-imperialist propaganda, especially against Americans. Uh, from the kindergarten, we learned about many horrible stories, about horrible, I mean, Americans are tortured North Korean citizens horribly, and uh, even these days, they are uh, colonizing South Korea and executing South Korean students. And so we, our hostile towards Americans were so high, and we are not considered them as a normal human being, and we consider them we have to kill them off. So even in school, in mass textbook, mathematic textbook, featured like uh, the questions like, here you see five American bastards, and Amer North Korean soldiers killed two, so how many American bastards are left? Like this, we have many questions like that. If, even when we were elementary school, we learned. And even today, we have rallies where people chant anti-American slogans and children attack cardboard American soldiers and even young kids singing hateful songs against Americans. Uh, as a North Korean citizen, that we know we can't say bad things or complain about the government and the leaders, and we can't call the real their leader's name without putting any specific titles behind their name. Also, if somebody who had the same name as their, as the leaders, they were forcibly to change their names. So in North Korea, we, in the PRK, we, there's no second name like Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and of course, Kim Jong-un too. And every North Korean, we know, but if we make mistakes by saying wrong things, would be entire family would be sent to the political prison camp. Because we have many examples, like entire family disappeared in the middle of the night, while one of the family members made a mistake by saying wrong things in the private meetings. And uh, at the time, I didn't know why they were sent, disappeared only in the middle of the night, not during the, time, during the daytime, but later, Actually, many years later in South Korea, I found the answer. The regime, they don't want people to see that because uh, there's no 
reason to take them, the not perfect reason they have, that's why. And then one of my friend's family, uh, friend's father, he was sent to the political prison camp because he told his best friend uh, during they have echoes. And then they, he said, this system is unfair. And then he was sent to the political prison camp while his family was forcibly removed to the desolate mountainous areas where it is extremely difficult to survive. And also my distant relatives also had personally experienced this horrible fate. Um, he came to North Korea during 1970s from China He's Korean Chinese, and he thought North Korea was going to be a communist utopia as the regime advertised. But later he discovered that propaganda was not true, so he decided to cross back into China in 1980s. But unfortunately, he was caught by the border guards, and in the end, he was sent to the political prison camp. And he was sentenced to 30 years at the time. And his son was only a baby, and after he at the time, and after he grew up, he visited the prison camp several times to see his father, but every time he was denied access. And uh, his father was never freed, and ev eventually after he died, his son couldn't even retrieve his body for a proper burial. Also, as a North Korean citizen, North Korean, we grew up with public executions. And I witnessed my first public execution when I was seven years old. And I was shocked to see a man was hanging by his neck under a railroad bridge. At the time, I was too young to figure out what was the considered a crime. But in North Korea, the, there was victims or executors or who was imprisoned. We have many different reasons. I mean, murder. It's the, certainly we will be executed in North Korea also, including you know, the person who killed a cow, or homosexuals, fortune tellers, defectors, or gay, or lesbians, and um, yeah, also a list of South Korean spies. So sometimes the schools canceled the classes so the student could witness the public execution. And people were scared, uh, to watching public execution, but we accepted the public execution as our part of our life automatically. And the constant executions were keep reminding me that I shouldn't do anything to disobey our government. Otherwise, you know, I will be killed horribly, exactly the victim in front of me. And so, but the biggest killer in North Korea is starvation, which has killed more than a million people. And before the famine, I saw uh, homeless people and uh, ho beggars on the street. And I didn't feel it was too strange because we, since we have a social hierarchy. But uh, from 1995, after Kim Il-sung died, just suddenly I was scared to see so many beggars and homeless people filling street and the markets. And uh, especially around me, the people around me were suffering. And when I visited my classmates' home in 1995, I found the whole family had nothing to eat for lunch. But still, at the time, I didn't know why they don't have lunch. And then also, when I, I read one death letter from a woman that was sent from Hamgyong North province, and the five family member was Dying, was waiting to die on the floor because they didn't have any food for weeks. And yeah, so at the time I was very shocked. I, I didn't know, I thought until then, I thought people only die in movies or novels or just uh, during the war period. But I couldn't imagine that because I thought we are the most privileged human being in this world and then they are dying for starving. So, and then I just, uh, I witnessed my most vivid memory was I saw in front of the train station on the ground the woman, the baby's mom was dying on the street. And then people were staring at that, but they nobody helped at the time. So during that time, especially if we go to the under the bridge or near the train station, we could see easily those dead bodies and they weren't removed so fast. So the smells of decomposing bodies were everywhere and then making people feel sick and 
goosebumps, you know, as they passed. And um, so my city was right next to the border with China, and we had many visitors from uh, China, and then it would be look shameful if we don't remove those bodies. So at the time, we had people, uh, people's job. So their job is only to get rid of those bodies, and then they used the hand carts and put, I mean, they stacked the bodies in piles. And one time there's a man who didn't die yet, but they did. They put him among the dead bodies. Since I lived right next border with China, and China was the only country I could compare with my own, and luckily our television could pick up Chinese TV channels, and it's illegal to watching TV to watching Chinese TV in North Korea. So every time, we, whenever we have a power. And I just uh, blocked window with a curtain and extra thick blankets to prevent prevent light. And I just uh, saw the Chinese TV, and then it looks more open and uh, just uh, economically developed. Everything is uh, different. What I saw because in North Korea we only have uh, one channels, and then you know what I heard the most was the little's name and the anti slogans or just propaganda words. Those things or what I saw, but from Chinese TV, even I'm surprised that, you know, even the products, I mean, the commercials on TV, the products can be publicly advertised. I, I never knew about those things, and then people dye hair, you know, jeans, everything is different. So I had a perfect reason to thought that my country is not the best in the world, because we also learned, um, North Korea was superior to China. So this is the reason that I left North Korea. But as a young, naive girl, I could have never imagined that I would be separated from my family for so long, nor could I have realized that I have to avoid the brilliant new world in China and live in the shadows. I was hunted by the Chinese authorities all the time because simply I was a North Korean defector. And also, eventually, I was caught by the Chinese police, and I was narrowly avoided being repatriated to North Korea by convincing them that I was actually a Chinese citizen. Uh, because of all the dangers surrounding me, I had to change my name constantly to protect my identity. So I became the girl with the seven names. And July 2nd, I published my, I finally published my memoir about self, this, about my self-discovery and hope and the, the mission to risk my family and guide them to freedom. Sometimes when I look back on my life, I sometimes wonder how I endured certain uh, situations and difficult periods. Um, it was uh, just a, I had to overcome so many obstacles in my life, so my life was like a roller coaster. And, but I was able to deal with many stress and just the difficult situations. But one thing I could have never handled was being separated from my family. Uh, because most people around the world might take their time with family members and friends for granted. But for North Korean defectors, we are painfully aware of how precious the time is together. Because many defectors, we are separated from our family members forever. And uh, so nobody should ever have to be you know, separated from their, the ones they love. Uh, too many North Koreans are still living in darkness, whether they are living in ignorance in North Korea or in fear outside of their homeland. Also, countless North Korean women are suffering in China right now as they are sold as sex slaves or as bribes to men, even at this moment. So that's why I'm so honored to speak in here today because uh, journalists like you are doing such you know, important, crucial work to shine the lights of truth in the darkest corners around the world and helping oppress the people to raise their voices and uh, the spread of the world. Noski Human Rights Tragedy must have become one of the international community's most pressing issues. 
and I'm very thankful for the growing support of North Korean human rights within the United Nations and international organizations, but we need to do more. And as free people around the world, we have a moral obligation to help North Korean people. Thank you for listening. <laughs>